I was uh, legitimately terrified. I have not updated my LinkedIn profile in years. So I did not know where that was going. Um, and hats off to pass me for being that clever. Um, so thank you, Alan. Um, when Alan and Kelly invited me, I said yes right away because I have a problem with saying yes to everything. Um, but Alan did a good job of telling you a little bit about my background. I teach at a community college where in our math department we have a single statistics course, elementary statistics. Um, before I taught in my department, I taught as an adjunct at five different schools at five different textbooks teaching introductory statistics. So it's kind of my baby uh, in some ways. And before I started teaching in those other formats, the first thing I did was flip my classroom. And then that sort of opened the gates of like, okay, what's possible? If I can flip my classroom, I could probably do it in half the time. Let's do hybrid. Uh, and then we had legislation come down where it said we had to support students. Everyone needs to be able to go into introductory statistics. No prerequisites, no placement exams. And so then I taught it in six hours a week, twice the time. So I had to figure out how to like make six hours of time with my students a week meaningful and worth showing up to. Uh, and then I was like, well, you know what? I could just do this entirely online. And then COVID happened, and so then I did all of that same stuff but on Zoom, and it was very exciting. So I have a lot of fun playing with course design and like reimagining my course and how to engage my students in these different formats. And when I'm not doing that, as Alan said, I'm really involved in professional learning. Um, I was our professional learning chair at my college um, and our STEM professional learning coordinator on a Hispanic serving institution grant. Um, and then I also say yes to a lot of presentations. Uh, the day before I came to US COTS, I was doing a three hour workshop on equitable grading with an English faculty member from another campus I had never met. It was a, it was a great time. Um, but I love grading and will talk to anyone about it. Um, a lot of you already know that, especially my uh, US COTS grading, uh, reading, what is it, grading for equity reading group, that table over there. Um, yeah, they know. I will talk to anyone about it at length for three hours even. Um, I also am really deep in the assessment world. I love the idea of finding out better ways to assess our students than the standard exam. So yeah, I'll say yes to a talk about that. Um, I do a lot of online work. I'm on our Mesa online success team. So when at one, our call, like California wide professional learning people came up and said, hey, will you teach, like do a presentation about blank in math and online teaching? I went, yeah, sure, I will. Um, and you know, I also manage our million dollar like ZTC grant. So helping faculty transition their courses to zero textbook costs and online. So that's one of my other um, jobs at the college. So I do a lot of, don't tell any of the sponsors this, I do a lot of um, work convincing folks that they can go to open educational resources, zero textbook costs. Um, so yeah, I do a, a lot of presentations. Um, and all that's to say, in the 27 presentations I've done in the last year, workshops, webinars, uh, none of them have been a keynote, not one. So when uh, Alan and Kelly asked me to do this, I was exceptionally flattered, but also terrified. So I did what any good student would do, and I went to a webinar on how to give a keynote. Yeah. I think I made it about halfway through before I was like, I'll watch the recording later. And then I didn't. Um, so that, that, was, that went well. Uh, how many people know who Robert Kaplinsky is? Oh, a sad number of hands. That is sad. Uh, yeah, so Robert Kaplinsky is big in the K-12 world. He does a ton of keynotes at math conferences, mostly at the high school level and below. Uh, but he is the author of a book called Open Middle. So open middle questions are questions where you use the digits one through nine to answer some question by putting them into some squares. So in case I'm boring later, I suggest that you take a picture of this so that you'll have something to work on for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, and if you need an extension, because we do need it to last 45 minutes, uh, right now you're taking the numbers one through nine and making the smallest possible standard deviation, but you know, you can also do largest. There are other measures that you could work with. Um, heck, you could take that final three-digit number and make it a two-digit and a one-digit, and then you have a whole nother problem to go. So I think you can, you can stretch this. You can, you can find something to entertain yourself, uh, statistics-related, for the next 45 minutes if needed. Um, but in that webinar, for the bit of time that I was there, uh, one thing stuck with me, which was this, this beautiful Venn diagram that he showed. 
of like, how do you decide what you would do a keynote on? And he was like, well, you gotta think about what you're good at. And I was like, well, there's a lot of things. Did you see the presentations, right? Online teaching, we could do something with OER, accessibility. I do a lot of work in the DEI space. Uh, eh, I don't know, and then what do educators need? I'm like, they need DEI, that's, that's the answer. I mean, all of those things a little bit, but not everybody's online. Accessibility does matter for everybody, so you know, if you want me to come back and chat about that, I will talk your ear off. But um, the last one, what do you want? Well, I didn't really have a choice. Because Alan and Kelly said, uh, it has to be on the conference theme. It's gotta be about communicating about and with data. And I went, okay, fine. So let's dive into that and unpack that for a second. So communicating about and with data. Okay, it's very, very broad. Can't screw that up, right? And like kind of the first thing I thought of when we talk about communication, typically this is what we're envisioning. I mean, obviously there are other ways to communicate, but like these rote sentences that we ask our students to sort of fill in the blanks for. Um, this one is from StatsMedic, which is a great website if you are not uh, AP stats person, they have like lesson plans for everything. If you are an AP stats person, you probably use them. Um, but this is exactly what Alan came and talked to my AP class about. He was generous enough to give his time and come talk to my AP class one time. Um, and this was the question we talked about, like how to interpret a z-score. And if you're teaching the AP, these are important. But these sort of sentences, while they're very valuable to us because now students are saying all the right things and not falling into all of those treacherous pitfalls we know exist. They sort of teach students that their voice is not as important as this correct answer, right? This is how we write it. All you have to do, I've told my students this, turn your brain off and just turn, fill in the blanks. Like don't even, don't overthink it. Just fill in the blanks and we'll all be good. You'll get your points, we'll move on. We'll never have to take stats again. There's only one stats class, right? So that's what I tell them. Unless you're inspired and you go to a four-year to take stats. So I am going to make this slightly interactive because I can't talk at anyone for 15 minutes straight. Not in my classroom, not here. Um, so I'm gonna give you a moment when you see that sentence, thinking about that, uh, to think about maybe the top three things that students should know or be able to do at the end of your course. And I have a timer here, because otherwise it's very hard for me to pause. So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about this. Top three things that students should know or be able to do at the end of your course. You can chat with your neighbors if you would like. All right, does anybody have one that they would want to share? Something that they want students to be able to do? Or that they should know at the end? Or something that someone else said? You can share someone else's brilliant idea. Take credit for it. Chelsea. Open a data file. Um, I will be the first to admit that I took a class where we use SAS. Are any of the SAS people in the room? I'm sorry, cover your ears really quick. Um, and the very, I think it was the second homework assignment, I couldn't get the data file to load. And I just, I spent like 30 minutes and just was like, I'm done, it's fine, I'll figure it out by the third homework assignment. That teacher never assigned another homework assignment. I got a 50% in homework because I never turned in this. It was like week three, how was I to know that he would never assign another homework assignment? And to this day, I, don't use SAS. 
<laughs> I still don't know how to load a data file in SAS. Someone can teach that to me later. Um, all right, so anyone else want to share? Let's get one more. That can't be the only thing we hear. Open a data file. So you can hear my own failings. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the knowing what to do when. So this idea that categorical versus numeric, one sample versus two, there's so many methods, are they even choosing the right one? You cannot, yeah. I get a lot of students who are trying to like make histograms out of categorical data. And they're like, why isn't it showing up in the list of, I'll tell you. All right, so we're gonna do this again, but now the question is slightly changed. What do you want students to remember about your course in five years from now? So I'll give you another minute. I love that you ended up at a table that's like thrown over to you. They're taking a very good so I love that. All right, so I heard Nick say something profound, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call. I'm gonna cold call on Nick Horton. Yeah, what? Yeah, empowered, right? Anyone else have something that they want to share in terms of where they want what they want students to remember in five years? Yes. We have to make decisions in life based on good evidence. That is profound. All right, Amy. I want my students to know that they can do hard things. Perfect. Thank you. You all, you all set up my next slide very nicely. I appreciate you. Um, so a lot of this, um, the work I do is in design, right? That's what made this keynote so hard to write is typically in a presentation, someone comes to me and they say, hey, if I'm invited, um, we really want our faculty to get X, Y, or Z out of this presentation. And so I'm able to write a presentation and create activities to help with that, right? So backwards then, we're starting with the learning goals instead of communicating about and with data, whatever you want to talk about. Um, and then we're designing assessments. How will I know at the end of my workshop, the end of my class, that my students, these faculty, have actually learned that thing? And then what content will help them get there? And so the first question is about your goals, right? If your goal is how will they know what to choose, then you're going, okay, so on an exam, I'm gonna have to have some sort of question about that, or I'm gonna have a project where they can choose their variables and they have to choose the right method to answer their question. Um, and then how will I teach them that? Well, let's, let's do some practice activities, right? Let's show them that lime green website where you can pick your inference method. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. Um, maybe I'll show it to you later. Um, but we need to also keep in mind that second piece. How are we letting students know through the design of our course, all of the choices that we are making as teachers, that they are capable, that they can do hard things, that data and good evidence are important in your decision making. Right? How are we weaving that into our course design? So as you were thinking about your courses, are you doing that? I hope so. 
Um, but that leads me back to our um, conference theme. And we, before we can even talk to students about communicating with and about data, which method to choose, how to talk about a histogram, we need to tell students that their voices matter, that it is not about regurgitating what I have told you as a faculty member, that your voice has a place in our classrooms. So how do we do that? And as Larry said yesterday in his keynote, right, everything is communication, everything starting from our syllabus to those five minutes we show up in early in class and chat with our students. Um, and then Aaron's five minute talk made me think about my own syllabus, right? So I pulled up that ridiculous thing. There are pictures of me speed puzzling on it. Um, it's fine, I, I, I do things that are weird. Uh, and I went ahead and made a word cloud. Just because, I mean, I was inspired. I was like, okay, I wonder what my word cloud looks like. Aaron said, We're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this thing. And clearly I was making my keynote after the Friday five minute things, so, uh, or editing it. One of those things, you can decide. Um, but I was happy to see, nowhere in here doesn't mention instructor. I think almost everywhere in my syllabus we are talking about how what we are gonna do as a community, what our course is about. And I was really happy to see some of these words like together and learning. Um, there's a lot of like logistics in the syllabus, so it's hard to not have things like class <laughs> and weekly. <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. Um, I don't know what's coming next. Maha. Uh -huh. um, but if you are new in the DEI space, right, about in terms of connecting with students, um, one of my favorite books is an entry into uh, equitable teaching practices is culture responsive teaching in the brain by Zaretta Hammond. Yeah, might as well. Uh, who has read this book? Also, embarrassingly small number of hands. All right, uh, it is written more for the K through 12 educators, but she does a lovely job of framing um, what it means to do equitable teaching because she almost comes at it from a deficit lens, which I think helps a lot of educators uh, in this mindset of okay, our students have been trained from years and years of education to be dependent learners. They are waiting for you to tell them the steps. They are waiting for that sentence where you just fill in the blanks, where you can turn your brain off, don't overthink it. I'm telling you what I want, just do this. And we need to undo that training. And how do we do that? How do we make students into independent learners who have control of their own learning? And she gives a beautiful framework, uh, one of which the pieces is like, you need to be connecting with your students, right? Another is we need to be making the students feel like they're in a, a learning environment where they're, they're all part of a team. Um, but she has a whole section on information processing and she gives this lesson plan design. And so we're, I'm kind of thinking about the third part of that backwards design, like how do I deliver my content? And the first thing is ignite. How are we making the students curious, right, about our uh, our material, how are we getting their attention? Then she moves on to like, okay, now we need to chunk it into bite-sized, manageable pieces at the right level for them. And here's my pitch, uh, that should happen in a flipped classroom. Where's Megan? Yeah, yeah, this should be happening in a flipped classroom because at that point, I can make that five minute video and students can rewatch it, students can pause it, I mean, it's the most efficient way to chunk your material, right? It's to let students engage with it in their own time. Um, and that gives you more time for the, the next two pieces, which is what are students going to actively do to work on this material, right? As Joe said in her five minute talk, students need to do statistics. They need to do data. So are we allowing them that time and space? Do we have that built into our actual classes? Um, and also, then we can talk to them when they're making the mistakes, right? We can give them that feedback in the most timely manner instead of them waiting. Like, I grade everything every morning. That is, I get up at 7 a.m., I grade my entire to-do list in Canvas, and I move on. So my students get feedback within 24 hours. But I am also an insane person who does that. So, you know, I don't, I don't ask that of anyone else. Um, but it is so much more efficient than even that 24 hours to just be sitting beside, like, like walking by a student and being like, wait, uh, have you considered, or oh, I, I noticed that, you know, it looks like Jack has a different answer than you. Maybe you two should chat for a little bit. 
and like see if you can come to a consensus. So that way I don't even have to do any work. I've just sort of redirected them that one of them has a mistake. So <clears throat> when I decided what I was going to do for this, um, I decided every talk I've ever given is always very teaching driven. It's like here's practical things to do. I am. I know stories are lovely and they grab people's attention, and I'll tell you some, but I am much more of a, here's a bunch of ideas, uh, choose the ones that work for you, or work on that open middle problem. Has anybody made any headway? Okay. Um, so anyways, we're going to talk about that first thing, that sparking curiosity. As Larry called it, our opening hooks, right? How are we getting students to want to know about what we're teaching them? I teach a class that is a service class. Almost none of my students want to be there. They are not sitting there, like, they're not stats majors. They're like, I need this for my nursing degree. I would love to get in and out as fast as possible. If I was like, hey, you can have a C without ever showing up, they would, many of them would take that and walk away, right? So I need to convince them that my class matters and that they are going to like it and that they can do hard things. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about assessment because it's kind of my baby. Um, and I think that how we assess students sends a stronger message than anything else in our courses, right? It's telling students who has the power in our classroom, who gets to make the decisions, right? Um, and then if we have time, uh, I have no idea what time it is because there is not a clock up here and I did not bring my cell phone. So it's great. It's great. We'll just, I'm going to. Assume I talk fast. Um, and so if we have time, we'll get to exploring content, at which point I will look at Alan and say, Alan, do we have time for this since I didn't bring my, my phone up here? All right, so let's talk about sparking curiosity. I'm going to give you a couple of ways that I do this in my classroom. We will actually participate in a couple because, as I said, very bad at talking at people for an extended period of time. Um, so small teaching, was that another USCOTS reading group? Yeah, thank you, Megan. Yes, so uh, Small Teaching by James Lang, uh, he has a whole chapter on prediction and its importance in learning theory. That as soon as you make a prediction, it really solidifies understanding. It has us build on existing schema. So he says, hey, the easiest prediction you can do in a class is have students do some sort of pre-assessment. If you have a quiz they're going to do, just give it to them at the beginning so that they know what's coming. They can see if they know anything or their intuition is correct before they begin. And so you're like, why the hell is there a picture of popcorn? Well, um, this is a, not, when, I, when I saw prediction, I immediately thought of Roxy Peck's two minute video from the last Uscots that was a um, little Easter egg inside of Gather, if you ever made it that far. If you made it into the room, there was a, a microwave that would play her video. Um, but it's a video where she talks about how the sound of popcorn popping follows a normal distribution. And so when I'm talking about prediction, I'm talking about things that quick five minutes of your time, of your class, to just get students curious and wanting to learn about what you're going to tell them. So how many people have done the Earth's surface type of activity, the globe, the blow up globe where you throw it around the room? There are a couple of people. So the way this physical activity worked back in the day is you threw around a, a globe. It was a lot of fun. And then you tell students wherever your like, right thumb lands, record whether that's water or land. And you would use that sample proportion of, of water coverage to then do a lot of fun inference, right, with your students. Uh, and since the pandemic, people redid all of these activities in Desmos, in the activity builder. So this is a, an activity where my students go to a random coordinate generator that puts them on the map. And they do that 10 times, and they figure out how many times it landed on water. And then it takes all of their little proportions and puts them in this adorable dot plot. So this is all of my students in one of my classes who did this activity. Uh, my classes are 46. I don't think there are some stragglers. Um, and what their proportions were in terms of water that they landed on. And so when it comes to prediction, the next question we usually ask students is what? Probably done some sampling distribution work in your classes. What do we usually ask students after this? What if we increase the sample size? Right, what would happen? So, I asked them about center two, but this one I think is an easier question. Uh, I asked them, easier for us to answer, not for them necessarily. Uh, compared to the n is equal to 10 graph, what if we did 40 clicks? What would happen to the spread 
of this distribution. What do you think my students said? You can yell it out. Oh, hell yeah, yeah. They really got it. And that's not a bad answer, right? If you weren't thinking about how that, that standard deviation is going to change, or the standard, if you're sitting there going, oh, well, more, that means there's a bigger change. We could possibly get some of those tail values. And we had just come out of the binomial where this is actually a true thing to say. So there's a lot of good thinking here. And it's a great place to start. It's a great place to have a conversation because now they're going, wait a minute, why? I don't understand. I want to understand why it's not the thing none of us thought it was, that it actually decreases. Um, another great source of sort of sparking curiosity, these opening hooks, is slow reveal graphs. I'm not going to have you do a show of hands because I already know it's going to be sad. Um, so Jenna Labe has this whole website full of these graphs where she's removed information. And she even has slides already made. I just took her slides because her covering up uh, rectangles are in this background color and it was just going to be a giant pain in the ass to redo them as my slides. Um, but yeah, she gives you a slide deck and the questions to ask your students. So the first slide is always the same questions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? And you're just going to like, there are dots. Some of them are a different color. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're, you're saying some fancier things in your head, but I'll, I'll play the role of a student. Okay. And then, it's, this is, here's the slow reveal part. We get a little bit more information. Now we see that y-axis. It goes from negative 15% to 20%. So was anything answered for us? Likely a change in something. Okay, so now we're thinking about that. We're also going, okay, now I kind of maybe understand the blue and the purple. I don't know why we needed those colors, but, you know, that's fine. Someone felt stylistic. It's great. And we get a little bit more information. Now we have an x-axis. $1,000 to $4,000. So I'm going to give you a minute. I know, there's like, oh, what the heck could this be about? What else do we notice? Anything else? Are we curious? Maybe a little. Okay, I'll give you more. The cities where blank are rising the fastest. So we just got our observational units. Those dots, they represent cities. Which, okay, so what the heck about cities would be in the 1,000 to 4,000 range? Ooh, rent. You are clever and good students. That is true. Do we have any questions, though, anything that we're wondering looking at these dots? What does the color mean? One is above and below. I would say negative or positive. Very silly. But yes. Um, I'm wondering why there are so few dots. I don't know a lot about geography because I am an American. Um, <laughs> but I am pretty sure that's not all the cities. So I'm, like, questioning, like, where, where are these cities from? Is this like from a certain state? Is that a reasonable number for us? I have no idea. Again, geography. I also was born and raised in San Diego, so like I don't really know what's north of LA. I don't actually know how Irvine and I, any, I, all of that is a mystery to me. All right, so yes, Kate was correct. Renters beware. The cities where rent is rising the fastest. We are seeing that percent change as well. And we've been given an x-axis label, median asking rent. Do we have more questions now? There are no negatives for the higher ends. It's just once you're in the suck, it keeps sucking. Yeah? And we're probably curious about what dot represents what city, right? We're probably sitting there in our heads predicting what those high-ass prices are. Where do you think those are? New York. Boston, Santa Barbara, <laughs> anywhere in California, yes. All right, and then we're probably asking too which ones the, the really high percentage, the ones that had the, the rents that were rising the fastest and the ones where there was like this precipitous decline. Where are those places?
All right, so then they give us slightly more information. They still haven't told us what the cities are. They've now told us at least that we have the 50 most populous cities and we have this percent change in median asking price. So we're going, okay, so 50 most populous. Does Santa Barbara make the list? All right. So we're going to edit that one out. But now but we have this more, this more information, right? And now we understand how there are so few cities, how there are so few dots on this scatter plot, right? And then, of course, we can add in our answers. So yes, New York, Boston, San Francisco uh, up there. And then we can see those, those places where the rents are rising the fastest. North Carolina, what is happening? We've got Raleigh and Charlotte on the map. But... I will tell you that this website is great because this activity takes 10 minutes. The slides are pre-made, the questions are pre-made. And on her site, oh, by the way, that gives you more, more information. The, set, the source is Redfin, so then you can have a real question about like, hey, this is asking price. What about the people who already have a rent? And has that increased over time in the same way? Are all rents on rent? We can have a really great conversation uh, about this data. And all of that is in her little questions at the bottom, so I don't honestly don't have to think too much. Um, but on her website, you can search by type of graph, so if you're in a particular part of your content, um, you can search by topic. So this website is really lovely as just a, a quick little icebreakery thing to do at the beginning of class. And the nice thing is, we all have the same amount of information about that graph, which is to say nothing, right? So everyone has that same, like, that's not always the case, right? When we do call and response when we're lecturing, there's always that student that's, like, first to answer. You'd be like, I want to hear from someone different. And you, like, make eye contact, like, please, shh, quiet. Or you have to, like, go up to them, like, could you wait, like, 10 seconds before you respond? Uh, because, well, it feels great to us. We're having this lovely interactive conversation with a student. There's some other student in the back of the room being like, I'm an idiot, because I didn't get it as fast as that student who took AP stats in high school with Amy. Right, and so we're, we're sitting there trying to give that message of like, okay, you know what? We all have a valuable voice because nobody knows what the heck is going on. Right, your observation might be really amazing. Um, another activity that I love to do uh, that really gets the communication is this Desmos polygraph. So if you've ever played the game Guess Who, um, this is the Desmos version. So you have to be in a synchronous class um, but it automatically pairs up students at random. One student chooses one of the 16 things. These happen to be histograms, but you can upload anything you want. You can put images in there, text, whatever you want. So you can upload 16 images. And then the other student is the guesser, and they can only ask yes or no questions. And so I love to do this before we've talked about the thing. It's great. I, I mean, I, I basically put my students in like a constant state of not knowing what the heck is going on so that they think that's normal. That they have to think on their own. Uh, and so you can see, this is a, a student's question about that. Does it spike up? To which the picker said, yes. And I'm like, what does that even mean? And then I looked at the ones that had been eliminated, and they were all the ones where the frequency of the mode was less than five. So it wasn't as tall, which is another one I see a lot, as the other graphs. I'm like, OK, OK, where is this going next? Because this they actually did this. this these two students got there. Uh, are they all touching? Yeah, pretty legit. Um, at this point, I have not chosen that one, but they eliminated all that bottom row and the one on the right. So they were left with those two options, and then they started asking questions about whether that one block was social distancing in the front or in the back of the, the rest of the data. COVID times. Um, but my students love this activity, so, so I should go back one. While they're doing this, I'm in the back end looking at all of these conversations, and I am screenshotting all of the questions they're asking and putting them into categories of like, okay, these were all about the outlier. Like, wouldn't, and I, we're sort of talking about, like, which was better communication than other communication, knowing that they weren't supposed to know at all what they were doing. Like, we had no idea what was happening. Was this clear? And then we're coming back, well, maybe we need some common language. Maybe we need a way to talk about these things, the shape of a histogram. And then I tell them what those traditional pieces are, but not until after they've struggled with it. Not until they want that stupid fill-in-the-blank sentence, and it's not just me saying, oh, by the way. 
here's what we do. And so my students really love this. They actually will ask to do it again in, in my classes where I'm not at a, a really a short timeline. Uh, they'll be like, can we do that again now that we know what we're doing? I think we'd be way better at it. Um, and way better is, I mean, the purpose of Guess Who is to guess as quickly as possible. So uh, my student fumbling in the dark actually got there faster than my student here who's asking beautiful questions, right? Is it bimodal? Does it have any outliers? Is there a negative skew, any gaps? Does the frequency of any bends exceed five? I wouldn't use language that precise. Dang. Yeah. So I give you all of these uh, because I do think that opening hook is so important, that, that spark of curiosity. And more so, we are telling students that it is okay to be intellectually curious, that failing is okay. We are normalizing mistakes by putting them in these situations where they're going to make a prediction and they might be wrong. Because he didn't feel bad about it. When we did Larry's exercise yesterday and we had to choose A, B, C, or D, I didn't care that I was wrong. I just wanted to know what the answer was and why it wasn't what I thought. You didn't tell me, Larry. I'll come find you later. So then we move on. We, well, let's, let's talk about the next piece. Okay, so we sparked curiosity. Technically, we should moving on to content, but we're going to move on to assessment. And before I really talk about assessment, I have to mention just grading schemes in general, right? We need to reflect on our grading scheme and where it came from. I know I inherited my first syllabus. I, I was given a syllabus as a TA. Um, I think I was given a syllabus in my first adjunct job. They were like, here's the syllabus. You can edit it, but like, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, of course I'm not going to edit this. Just leave it like this. Um, and there were many, many years of me like moving around category grades, trying to like achieve what I was looking for, this perfect grading system that never really existed. So I just, grades are objectivity theater to some extent, right? We are putting numbers on things and then averaging all those numbers and saying at the end of the day, these tell me something about you. But like, as if there wasn't a thousand subjective decisions that went into all of those points and how those points got combined together. We, we pretend they're ob objective in some way. So that was my grading rant. Um, now I'll move on to talking about how we can assess students. Um, so. If you are at the beginning of any sort of grading journey, if, if what I said was not completely off-putting and you're like, I'm curious, could I do grading better? What, what the hell else is there? Uh, an easy start, uh, a toe, it, dipping a toe in the water, uh, is grading for equity. As I said, I, I've read this book like four times, many times in different reading groups. The most valuable was doing it with a bunch of other stats professors um, and sort of diving into the ideas of it with them. Um, but one of my favorite ideas is this just equitable grading practices allow and encourage mistake making as a means for learning. And so in my class, my students can reassess or revise everything. And from an equity perspective, this is essential because our students don't come in all the same. They have different levels of preparation. They have different resources at home. And so if we treat them all the same, right, if we put them all in the same grading system or tell them you have to know this material by week three, we are not doing all of our students a service, right? Our student who came in with less preparation might need a little bit longer, but do I care? I just want them to get there by the end of the course, right? And so by reassessing, I'm allowing students who came in with weaker skills to catch up, right, with the support given in class. Now, I also have to talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, this is my abstract. Don't know if you read it or you're just a good student who showed up at 8 a.m. because you were told to. Um, I reread it to make sure I was sort of talking about it today as I made my presentation. Uh, yeah, so the way this all went down, they asked me for a title. I went, mm, all students, yes. That, that gets at the equity thing I'm thinking I'm going to talk about, the DEI slant. Uh, and then they came back for an abstract uh, a couple months later. I went, oh, shit. I gotta write an abstract? Now you're asking me to do more work? I already have to write a presentation? And I'm like, okay, now, now, and then I start getting nervous. Is an abstract for a keynote different than an abstract for a presentation? 
I've never, I've never done a keynote. I'm, I'm confused. And so I went to my good friend and our students' even better friend, ChatGPT. And I asked it, write me a 250-word abstract for a keynote about communicating about and with data. Alan had no idea this happened. This is how I did it. All right. Um, and then I went, okay. It didn't really get the equity piece. It didn't understand my vibe, what I was going for. Let's try that again. Rewrite the text above to be about equitable teaching. And then it really, it, it screwed that up too because it just rewrote it and did, like there was no stats. And I was like, okay, I can, I can do better. Rewrite the abstract to be about communicating about and with data from an equitable teaching perspective. And it gave me something not half bad. Now, that is not the same thing that ended up in my abstract, but I definitely used it as a starting point. And I bet if you looked at the two, there are some sentences that remained that were pretty good. Um, but, I mean, part of the reason I changed it, it was very prescriptive. It was like, first, I will talk about, and I was like, I haven't written this, and do not pigeonhole me. I want to be able to go wherever I want. Um, but our students are using this, right? If you haven't already seen it, you will. Uh, and in fact, I went ahead and fed ChatGPT one of Alan's questions from his askgoodquestions.blog, which if you haven't read, go back, you know, make that a summer project. Nice pitch for you, Alan. <laughs> but this one is a pretty standard one for anyone who's read the AP exam. Um, researchers found that people who use candy cigarettes as children are more likely to become smokers as adults compared to people who did not use candy cigarettes as children. Identify the explanatory variable, identify the response variable, and then, you know, the confounding variable, all that good stuff. And ChatGPT got a three by the AP rating system. They nailed everything except for that uh, response variable, that response B. The response variable in this study is the likelihood of becoming a smoker as an adult. It's the same mistake my students make. If a student did this, I would be like, oh, they, this is their own work because they made the student mistake. So we really, really need to think, ass rethink assessment in the face of ChatGPT. Or just be happy to give all of our students Bs. Right? And I don't think rethinking assessment is, I need to make sure it's them writing. I'm going to have them do a time test. That is not my answer to chat GPT. Though, eh. I would say one, we can lean in. If this is a take home test question, we tell them if you want to use chat GPT, you need to then grade it. We maybe even change the question. Feed this into chat GPT and tell me if their answer is perfect or not and why not. Right? That's available. If you don't have ChatGPT because you don't feel like giving the internet a bunch of information, just answer the question for me. I'm fine with either of those things. Or heck, I could give them this answer and tell them to spot the error, right? ChatGPT can't catch its own error, so I'm, I'm pretty golden. Uh, yet. Uh, so at the moment, I'm pretty golden. Um, but in general, we just need to make assessments that students want to do. If a student is using ChatGPT to answer something in my class, I am not thinking it's something wrong with them. Right? I'm thinking it's something wrong with me in some ways that I haven't shown them the value of that assignment. Right? That they just decided I want the points more than I want to do this learning. So I haven't, I haven't communicated that well enough. And so what, what could I do different? So one of my suggestions um, is within our assessments to give students choices. So this is universal design for learning is to let students showcase their own. And it, it works on an equity perspective, right? Students can showcase their own skills and what they have as their strengths. So like I do this for every portfolio, I've moved away from exams, um, where my students can, can choose. I'll give them three options. One is usually like you can build something for the course um, and then they're, you know, they're different. But I always give my students options on how they can respond or show their understanding instead of just saying here's the way. There is only one correct way to show me you understand this material. It might be make an infographic or make me that video elevator pitch or write me a quick article. Your choice, right? A tweet, right? You can give me any of those things, whichever fits your, because some students, you give them, a, give them a video assignment and they will spend hours on it, right? They like love that. Some students you give them a video assignment and they're like, never. I'll just take the zero, much like me in that SAS uh, homework that didn't load. Um, 
Uh, another thing is we just need to make our uh, assignments and assessments more authentic, right? More real world, more related to the things that students want and not what we assume students want, right? Let students research whatever they want. Maybe they're not interested in social justice issues. Maybe they just want to know about sports. That's fine, as long as they're engaged with the material. And it doesn't have to be a project, right? I do a lot of this in discussion boards, where like the very first discussion board's like, hey, what's your major or your job? What is something you can collect observational data about? Like, what is something you could collect data about? And I give them the example of my, I, I do speed jigsaw puzzling as a hobby. And I'm like, hmm, I could collect data about puzzles, right? So puzzles could be my observational units. And then I ask them to find four variables, come up with four variables about that thing. So I'm like, okay, piece count, that's easy. Brand, okay, piece cut, because there's ribbon cut and there's random cut. I'm deep in the puzzle world, guys. And then maybe the time it took me to complete it, right? And then I have them tell me whether those variables are numeric or categorical. So we're starting towards that, like, do you know what to do when? But they're also seeing the value, right? So all of my discussion boards do something like that. And that's the kind of crap you can't even feed into ChatGPT. You could, I guess. You'd be like, write me this thing about, and then put in your interest. I have found that students that are lazy enough to just copy and paste ChatGPT will put in the prompt as is and not even replace the thing that they're interested in. Um, and so then it's very, like, this lovely generic answer to this prompt. Um, and if I'm talking about authentic assessments, I have to point out that even those lovely discussion boards I have are what we would call disposable. Students spend time writing them, I spend time grading them, and then they are gone forever, right? If it wasn't a discussion board, they would throw it in the trash. But instead, it just lives in Canvas until Canvas closes or whatever at the end of the semester. So it has no value to the world. So what's the alternative? Well, uh, renewable assignments. Renewable assignments are assignments where students are doing something that is of value to more than just them. Now this particular uh, table is from David Wiley and he defines them even more broadly than uh, I do. I would consider what he calls authentic to be renewable, which is that has an artifact at the top. It says an artifact that has value beyond supporting the creator's understanding. So when I have my students create something for the rest of the class, they're creating a solution manual for the rest of the class, right? They're co-creating that. That he would call authentic. I would call renewable, right? There's value in what they're doing for more than just them. But I have my students often write things for my next class, right? I'm still working on the course. I'm always building it. Help me build content for next semester. That is what I'm asking you to do. Your voice matters, and I would love to include it in my course next year. So give me an example to put into this. Or why don't you write a question for the, quest the test bank? It shows your understanding. Uh, and if you want to go really far, you put this out into the world. You make it public. You can make like a Google site that your students are creating, something like that. So how am I on time, Alan? Perfect. Excellent. This is going well for me. All right, so <laughs> our last <laughs> section is exploring content. So I, I made this pretty short. Uh, this is both Zoretta Hammond's chew and uh, chunk, but I mostly am sticking with the chew part of that. And so um, how are we doing on the open middle question? Anybody get there? I'm gonna assume that means I'm very engaging. Oh wait, someone said yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> How do we know if you're right? That's the next question. <laughs> there has to be a better way. Uh, but open middle questions are a great way to have students chew on the content, especially from an equity perspective. The reason they're called open middle is that anyone can get engaged in it. If you have a really great understanding conceptually of what standard deviation is, you can get started, right? Even if you don't, you can just start plugging numbers in. Right? You can just do the algorithmic method and just see what happens. And maybe, through that process, discover a little bit about standard deviation. Maybe. Right? And then you're gonna have a conversation, because my students are always in groups anytime they're chewing on something. Uh, another piece of this, like, chewing on things uh, in groups, you do want to randomize groups. If you haven't read the Building Thinking Classrooms book, um, the reason we randomize groups is so that students are constantly, like there's no incoming assumptions, right? No student is always the leader. Every day you're with someone new and you're like, I don't know how this person is gonna react. And so everyone sort of is 
a little bit on edge, but you're also like removing the status that students sometimes have within a classroom. Um, another thing I love to do to have students chew on content is ask them which one doesn't belong. The which one doesn't belong questions are great uh, for some, some dialogue where, again, there is no wrong answer. So these are, um, by the way, exam score, uh, histograms of exam scores for one of my classes. Um, it was the same exam I gave to four classes. I was teaching four sections of statistics that semester. Gave them all the same exam because I'm not a, you know, a monster um, in terms of my own workload. And we have, uh, I taught this class supported, so that was the six hour a week class. I taught it hybrid, so we met for half the class time. And then I had two eight week fully online sections. One was the first eight week and one was the second eight week. Um, any, anybody want to say which one they think doesn't belong? Why? Yeah. All right, A does not have the left skew that is at least somewhat visible in the rest, right? Yeah, Kate. Why doesn't D? Oh, D is the only class without a gap. Hmm. Okay. Anybody want to say why they think C or B doesn't belong? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, B is the only one with the, the score close to zero. I always, I'm like, I wonder if that's a zero or if that's like legitimately like a four. But I, it is a zero. I went and looked at the data. Um, and then I usually ask my students, like, which class would you want to be in? Right? Yes, C did very well. They did very well. And then I ask my students to predict which class is which. I tell them about the breakdown of all those classes. I'm like, which one do you think was the supported class? the one that was meeting for six hours. Which one do you think was the eight-week class, the hybrid? Um, by the way, because I know you're curious, uh, A is my supported class. That class is always very bimodal in terms of ability levels uh, because there's no, you, there's no anti-requisite. No prerequisite, but students can sign up even if they have the, the prerequisite skills to get in. Um, C was my first eight-week class. In the first eight weeks, they have the options to sort of move Right? There's other classes available. And I actually do move some students. So I might have grabbed this data a little late, um, where usually if someone does really poorly on that first exam, when I had exams, I would try to tell them that maybe one of the other classes would be a good option and we should do a course transfer so that they can have a little more time because the eight-week pace is daunting. Um, B was my hybrid class. Um, that little blip from 20 to 30, I think, of the students who didn't watch any of the videos before they came to class or do the online work. Uh, and then D was my second eight-week where uh, it's spring semester and these students need stats to transfer, so they are gonna hang on no matter what. Um, but they're not necessarily, a, an online class is not for everyone, right? It, it does take some intrinsic motivation to, to do all those things. So, <laughs> I, I already talked about a flipped classroom. I do think that's a, a very vital piece of making sure you have this time to have students' voices heard. Because they're, they, if they're not talking in class, that's not gonna happen, right? So. So moving the lecture online. Um, if you're doing that, moving the lecture online, I strongly suggest that you integrate, this is a calculus example, I was too lazy to redo this, uh, but that you integrate um, written as well as text, as well as video, so those students have those options. I know that I will not watch a five minute video ever, um, even when I assign them for students. When I assign them to students, I watch them, but that is the only time. Uh, if I have to learn something, I am looking for text. I want to read fast, just get to where I want, instead of scrolling through someone's life story. Um, so I leave you with this sort of thought here, this, this lovely quote from Jose Antonio Bowen. Um, I actually think that what we do as teachers is we motivate, we design. We're really cognitive coaches. That's a much better title for what we do. We design situations where you do the cognitive work. So we need our students to be doing the data, doing the statistics, right? Uh, so with that, I say thank you. I do, before you clap, sorry. I do want to say, I'll go back and you can do it then. Um, I did want to say when this gets posted, I did put a bunch of resources. So if you're curious about anything, 
I put that all in there. Um, and then uh, there's been talk of an AP Stats Reader photo. So if, if that's still something people want to do, we could come up here and do that afterwards. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kelly. We do have time for a question or two. Raise your hand. I'll call on you. Speak loudly. John. Oh. Are we going to get the answer to the question about the four numbers? I can pull up the Open Middle website. It's on there, but I don't have it. <laughs> I'd say give them another 24 hours before you do that. <laughs> another question. Yes, please, Kim. More about portfolios. So I don't, I haven't gone to the full ungrading. I would love to, but that like requires me really conceptualizing this portfolio. If I were doing that, I might have students put into like a Google slide at the end of every day, like a takeaway from that group work. So that I'm not grading the group work, but they can then say like, oh, here's what I got out of it. Um, and then I do, at the end of every section, instead of an exam, I have a portfolio where like, they do a reflection, which is in an individual discussion board so that they can see their past responses. Um, and then I can reply back. And then they do a project, which is always something that they give them three options on what they can do. And usually they can suggest something else if that's what they want. But one of them is usually like build learning material. Like do some, build something that you think would help future students, explain why it would be helpful, and I will include it in the course. That's almost always part of my portfolio. The question was about the renewable assignments. Do you do anything where students produce something that will be useful to them later? That is a beautiful question. And like if I, I think there are, there are classes where that lends better, like in a CIS class, like students are making that portfolio, that thing that they can put on their GitHub and show that they are able to do certain things. Since I'm an intro stats class and such a service course, I don't find myself doing things that are gonna be useful for students further on because typically my hope is more of those, what do I want them to remember in five years, that they can do hard things and not that they have, yeah, I might, yeah. I'm just not sure how many of them go to that project after the class, right? So like he was saying that the, the project sort of does that. And I was like, yeah, but they remember the, what happened in the project. They're not using it in any valuable way for themselves. I mean, I guess they could put it on something if they wanted to. Yeah. Yes, please. Recommendations for quick class closing assessments? I mean, exit tickets, simple. I mean, I actually do a name tent even in my college classroom because I want them to know each other's names more than it's for me. I remember everybody's name after the first week. Um, but in that name tent, I've started doing the thing where they have a space to respond. And so you can do a, a date, like a weekly uh, thing for them to respond to and you can respond back. It's just, it's fun, honestly, of like, a, oh, hey, how did, how did it go today or what's, Sometimes it's just about their life, just like, hey, anything, any successes you want to brag about? Um, so that, that has been an easy racket for me. Yes, in the back, please, Danny. Because, sure. The, the nice thing about that is you get to think while I'm repeating. Oh, I already know my answer. Okay. Well, the question was about the, the admirable goal of what having students know they can overcome challenges and do hard things. And the question is, what about using a computer 
That's one of the hard things that they learn how to do. Thank you, Danny. Uh, yes, so I have been on that same board of like, because like with the shiny apps and things like that, it's like there's a big ask when you're telling students to learn R on top of this really challenging content, right? Or to do something like, I, I did a class where we used Excel, and to just be like, oh, just click on any cell, and students are like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't, we need a common language first. So I agree with the pushback on certain types of technology and that you're teaching, like our curriculum is already so bloated. I have to teach counting and inference on standard deviations, as well as mean, median, mode through ANOVA. Like it is, it is so bloated. Um, and so adding that to it is just a non-starter in some ways. Do I wanna have that as an option for students? Yes. Do I think that we should not use it as an excuse? A bit, but I also think there's a, a, there's a place for a certain technology, in my opinion, and maybe it's not in the intro classes when students are already struggling, but as an option for students who, who want to venture into that land. But yes, they can do hard things. And now with ChatGPT, I hear coding is a breeze, so. <laughs> On that thought, I need to call an end to the questions, but Kelly will be around. You can ask her questions individually.